Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jeremy Russell. Um, I'm the account manager here at Applied CX. Um, I just wanted to introduce George Laird um, briefly, but just you know, um, give it a couple seconds just to make sure everyone's attending. Yeah, that's a Jeremy. Hi, hi guys. This is George Laird. Jeremy is a. It's one of those things. He. This is his first seminar with us, and <laughs> it's like, well, Jeremy, this is engineering. It's eight thirty. We start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Because we're on a tight schedule. We got a lot to show. And so, okay. Yeah. What else? So it's I'll it's uh it. so Dr. Uh, George Laird, um, and then also we have Adrian Jensen answering call or answering uh, questions um, as well. But yeah. So uh, I'm the account manager here. So I do all of this AE sales side for our engineering team. Um, and uh, you know, right now we're primarily focusing on BMAP, but we sell a number of other products within the Siemens portfolio. Um, recently just got star CCM. So if you guys are doing any flow or um, heat transfer kind of um, problems, um, talk to us, talk to, talk to George, talk to myself and we can set you up. But yeah, we have, you know, over 30 engineers on staff that help us on the PLM and the CAD and this DAE um, portion of our business. So if you guys ever need any support, if you're not already a customer, reach out to us and we can help you out. But um, yeah, today's primarily about VMAP um, and George is going to give you just a rundown on the Bolt Seminar. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. This is our group. Um, Bjorn Vanderbrew, our, our digital marketing manager, put this together to help explain who is Supplied CAX. And we're a group of 30 engineers on two sides out of Sherpa Design and Predictive Engineering. So you guys see this and you can talk to Jeremy Russell if you have other questions on the sides. And this is our presentation. Some of the classes we have coming up, BMAP training, April 22nd, 26th, LS Dyna training in May 13th, 17th next year. Promotions, all this. All this stuff will be online once we, we're recording the seminar. So once we get done, this will be uploaded as a PDF along with the complete video and also some models. Some of the, the training models that you see in the seminar will be uploaded in a package. This is our table of contents outline. Here we go. I got 45 minutes to do all this. So I'm going to go quickly. If you guys have questions, there is a way you can enter a question on the go to meeting bar and Adrian is on hand to answer questions that come up. Otherwise, it's full speed ahead. If Adrian pings me and says, wait, 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 there's something, somebody's got a question they don't follow, then I'll stop and pause. But otherwise, it's going to be a monologue as fast as I can do it. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. There's a lot. Adrian's got a little bit of a throat cold, so <laughs> it's no point. He can laugh, but there's no point for him talking today. I'll be, I'll be, oh. lurking, I'll be lurking in the background answering questions. <laughs> right on. What we will cover, there's so much on bolt modeling. If you guys are here, you've done the Google search, and man, there's everything out there. Um, it's 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 a bit of a wilderness. So many different ways of doing it, and what my research has has shown over 20 years of fooling around with FEA, there's no right way. It, it's it's very particular to the type of model that you have, your type of idealization challenges. There's no one one way that's going to fit. So we're going to keep it really narrow. We're going to do a lap joint. We're going to talk about one particular class of bolted connections. We'll cover loading tensile and bending, what type of bolted joint. Uh, we'll touch into nonlinear analysis, the basic beam RBE combination. And of course, we got to compare it to something. So we have a 3D model we'll use as our baseline. And we'll go through that. And lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about fatigue, but don't get your hopes up. Uh, I think when we get there, you're going to see how we do the fatigue analysis and you guys will roll your eyes and you're yeah, fine. We don't do spot welding. There's a whole another class out there, how to handle that. There's no discussion of what the best connection, because as soon as you start saying best, you know you're going to be wrong. Somebody will say, well, that's not true. We did it another way that didn't work for us. And it's true. There is no best idealized connection. It's just 
how do you get something that's conservative? How do you get something that won't come up later and break on you? So we're going to be aiming for the conservative idealization. No proprietary software solution. I, I understand out there that sometimes these seminars are used for marketing that, oh yeah, just do this, you're going to have a perfect connection. Or yeah, with this tool, boom, you're going to be able to model all bolted connections with a few clicks doesn't exist. It's sort of like optimization software. It's like, oh yeah, you can buy this optimization software and you too will be an ace simulation engineer. I don't think that exists either. What we know, okay, at Predictive Engineering, this is, uh, we do consulting services. I think we're almost at going on year 25 out of it. And before that, it was more academic research. But so here are some examples of models that we've done that had some significant challenges with bolt modeling. The one that left is a, it's a large eight speed transmission and we were bolting the, the separate castings together. And we were preloading the bolts to get the seal and contact between the various castings. And then we are extracting out the axial and shear forces of all the bolts to do a specialized fatigue calculation on that. I'll show, I'll, I'll show that a little bit later. The other one is bolted flanges, where we actually do uh, 3D bolts, load them up, get the right contact load. The one on the right, you guys might have seen that. That's uh, the Norton motorcycle crankcase, and that was the, the flash screen uh, for a while on FEMAP, the prior revision. On the left, an open lining pit conveyor, large 3D model, full-on 3D bolt, full-on contact, high load, slippage, fatigue analysis. All sorts of, you know, and then the more standard shell model with beam connections. Another uh, example with flanges and beams and rigid links. I skipped a page. Going into other types of, of connections for, for sheet metal fabrication and where you're trying to get the bolt head and preloading it against multiple plates and aerospace modeling. You can see it's, it goes on and on. There's so many different ways to model a connection. And for each one of these models, we've done something a little bit different on each one. Sometimes there'll be an RBE2, sometimes there'll be an RBE3. Like for this example, it's an RBE3 to distribute the mast of the tower up on top into the structure. And the rest of the connections between the panels are RBE2s because the dom it was for vibration analysis and aircraft work, more joining structures together, more connections, joints all sorts of stuff so there's never been any one right way of doing things why all bolt modeling has its challenges i want to start with discussing that we have a hole in a plate and anytime you have a hole in a plate and you're pulling on it far field load you're going to get a, a stress concentration you get the stress concentration of 3x along the meridian plane and this is sort of interesting. At the very top, you can zoom in, you can see this little thing says minus 100%. Well, what you have there is you have a compressive stress of one. And of course, you know, as I mentioned, you got three X positive or uniform tensile. Now, if you flip the sign around and you compress the material, then obviously, then you have a compressive stress magnification of 3x, but you have a tensile stress at the top of the hole. So this is one of these rules of thumb, sort of why even under compression, you can get things to fail because all materials have defects. All materials have some sort of hole or discontinuity in the, in the crystal structure. Leave that may be. Let's just start with the simple thing. You pull on something, has a hole, 3x. That's why modeling bolts is always sort of complex. It's always a little bit scary. And, and you see in the lower left-hand corner, I thought this, if with pure shear, you have a stress concentration of 4X around the hole. This is one of those things in composites why it can get tricky, you know, because you're always punching holes in it for fasteners and other things. And well, if you get lots of shear, you have a 4X. And of course, anytime you pull on it, it's 3X. Let's start simple. We're gonna to get to our lap joint here in a second. 
And we're only 10 minutes into the presentation. So let's just take a plate, do a bearing load on it. And this is something you can do really easy in FEMAP. There's a, a bearing load ability under the loads. You might have seen it, bearing load, and you can go ahead and put on a, a magnitude of a force and give it the, the range the, the, of where, how to apply it. And does a sinusoidal um, application of the load along it, along it. So on this, it's a simple plate. It's 10 inches long, quarter inch thick, two inches wide. We got a hole that's a half inch in diameter. So, what happens? We put a load. We put a 250 pound, 180 degrees. We get a stress of 2,900 psi von Mises around it on the edges. And the same for the principal stress when it gets pulled. And this is our 3x concentration. The reason why I picked 250 pounds is because that gives us a a, a uniform stress back here of 1,000. So there's our 3x around a hole, standard. Adrian, you're still there? I thought I'd check in. Yeah. yeah I, know you, I know you're on mute, so I, it's, it's a little yeah. <laughs> tricky. Am I going to fast? No I'm doing good, no I think okay. we got a good well, you, Yeah, you're my feedback monitor too. If I'm going too fast or I'm like skipping something useful, just, just ping me. Okay, go back on mute. <laughs> and. Uh, now, on the prior example, it's 180 degrees all the way around. And that'd be like a perfect bolt, perfect fit, never exists. Of course, we're always going to have gaps because manufacturing, you've got to be able to get the bolt into the, into, into the structure, through the hole. It has to fit up. So the bolts are always going to be smaller. There's going to be a gap. When you have a gap, that means really your contact patch is much smaller. One of the sort of the standard patches I've seen is like a 45-degree region. 22.5 on either side, that gives you 45. So then what happens when you load it up? Well, unfortunately, if you look at the von Mises, you get this hot spot because you got a concentrated load because you're just pushing a force on it. So the von Mises is not useful, but the principal stress, yeah, that, that does make good sense. So you can see it bumped up to 3,400, which, you know, not a big deal considering our prior one was 2,900. So 3,400, just another, Another check, okay. Then let's go into the RBE idealization. The first step of, you know, creating the standard connection. You know, you have two plates, you're gonna use an RBE type of element and a beam element, but let's go simple. Let's just put an RBE on it, pull on it, see what happens. Now, since an RBE is rigid, it's as if we welded something around inside the hole. Obviously not what we have, but that's what an RBE does. And so there we get a von Mises stress of 1200. You get these hot spots. You get a principal stress, 1400 PSI. Again, that doesn't seem reasonable. So that's what an RBE two. So what happens with an RBE three? Well, we're distributing the load, an RBE3 is a, as a force interpolation element. So it's not adding stiffness into the structure. So this is the way that we set it up. The independent nodes, we're only transferring the three degrees of freedom because we have a solid element. There's only three degrees of freedom at each node. So doing that, that doesn't really make sense either. RBE3. So what do we know? Holes are stress concentrations. If you pull on a plate with a hole, you're gonna have a 3X effect. And that's why bolted connections, oh, it's, it's always a nervous spot when you're doing a model. You're always checking, you're always wondering a little bit what's happening, but that's fundamentally, mechanically, that's what you got. The bending, and likewise, the bending stress field is, is bumped up because you put a plate under bending, it's like you have a very thin tensile field, of course, on one side, compressive, compressive on the other. And you can imagine, of course, why things fatigue so rapidly going up and down, up and down. Because you're getting, even under compression, you're getting a tensile stress at the very top of the hole of one. Three X the other way. So you get huge cycling effects. So bending stress likewise, 
And lastly, don't get your hopes up that any idealization technique is going to work. They're all going to be a bit off. So here's a summary. Bearing load, you know, idealization, well, 2,900. 45 degree, well, 3,400, but any of the RBEs, not useful. Reality of a boat and a plate, well, we're going to get there. We're going to get close to it, but I don't think we'll ever actually get reality. What do you really do? Well, you guys have been working in aerospace, you know. <laughs> uh, you take your you take your shear load from the boat, and you figure out if, if what it's going to do to your connection, whether you're going to have tear out. You know, you just take your bolt shear, because that's what's being transmitted between the plates, right? And uh, you can look up for allowables. You can say, well, what's the bearing load allowable for that plate? You look at the mill handbook, you dig out your class materials, and you go through these calcs. But fortunately, for most of us doing standard analysis, we're not tearing things out. We're never gonna, we're never gonna have shear loads quite that high. But it's, these make good checks. You can, you know, you can imagine you could, you could get your spreadsheet with these checks lined up on the side to just do, you know, like, okay, what's my margin? What's happening? The bolted lap joint. Our test case is a lap joint where we will pull it and bend it. This is our foundation for this discussion. We're just going to be working around with this lap joint. Bolt going through it, give some ideas so if you can see how you get these pinch points. And now I'll show these, I'll show this pinch point here in a 3D model. So this is our example. This is our baseline. Got to have a baseline. 3D model, same plates as before that we were talking about, eight, eight inches long, two inches wide, quarter inch thick, whole diameter, bolt, everything. And these models that I have here, these test cases, they're going to be along with, with the video and the PDF. So if you guys want to play around with these on your own, own system, they're there. And on the lower right-hand corner is our bolt, our 3D bolt with the bolt heads all put together. Everything contacts, everything's set up, everything can be nonlinear. That's our, that's our baseline. What happens? You pull on it. Pull on one end before restraining the other. Of course, scaled by 25X, you get this little bending here. And then this is classic. Look at this. You get this bearing pinprick of stress 18,000 PSI. Nice, huh? But that's, I mean, that's what you would expect to get. I mean, you got a real bolt, you got right here. You know, you got that, as it pulls, there's slop in the bolt. There's always, there's always a gap. So you're gonna get this little build up there. So what do you do with, I mean, 18,000? Well, we'll just, we'll use it as a placeholder. The principal stress is more reasonable, 6,600, like that. Now, these numbers, I'm going to do a summary chart at the end of each section. So, because the next slides, there's going to be a lot of numbers and a lot of images, and um, they're all for later. <laughs> I'm going to do a summary table to, to bring it all together. So, then we have bending. I put a uniform pressure load, 33 psi. You do a little hand calc, you got 3,100 psi maximum bending stress. So to hold this together, I mean, this is a 3D model. I'm not doing any real bolt preload. I'm just, it's like 10 pounds. It's just sort of keep things in place and no friction. This is the most conservative. You can see at 25X, you can see things are sliding around like here. And well, you know, it's exaggerated 25X. It's, it's gonna move a lot, but the stress is 4,200 and 4,000 for this standard connection. And on the second case, now let's crank it down to something reasonable. Now I got some real, I, what I did is I just put enough bolt preload on it to keep things from moving, to lock it up frictionally. 
because I didn't want to have the bolt preload stress interfere with the other stresses that we're seeing. So, and in this case, 4,800 and the tensile stress 3,300. Very reasonable. Bending looks reasonable, stress looks reasonable for bending. Now let's get to, get into our shale models. This is what we, may I want to say like, what stress, what simulation engineers, this is, this is where we live. We live structures with shells. We got to get connections put together. We got to join them somehow. We're doing a beam element. We're doing RBE twos attached to it and done. That's, that's what we, that's what we had to live with. So. Edge connection, RBE2, RBE3, 9,000 PSI, 8,700. Um, down here, maximum principal stress, 10,000. Hey, Adrian, are you picking up background noise? All right. I'm the, no, audio is no. nice and clear for me. Yeah. Good. God. Modern technology, noise cancellation technology. Okay, so on our edge connection, you guys are familiar with that with the way of doing this. This is really the standard. You got a hole, you grab the nodes around the hole, you slap an RBE onto it. Doesn't matter, RB2, RB3, put a beam in between. And if you look in FEMAP, there's various little API tools to help you out. You know, you can pick the nodes, pick the beam, done all sorts of setup like that. And this is edge, and this is really classical because old school modeling, you don't have times to put a washer onto your geometry. And if you had to do washers, it would be, make you gotta make the curves. It's a lot more work. Things have gotten a lot better. I mean, there's ways to automate it. The tools are really have improved, but really until the last couple of years, it was always doing it by edge, so. It's an example of edge. We're doing RBE2 and RBE3. And here are the stresses you're getting. Bomesis, maximum principal, same way, bomesis. And this is a format. I'll go like this for the edge. It'll be one side RBE2, the other side RBE3, bomesis, maximum. I'm going to go fast, a little faster through this because uh, there's just, you know, you're going to, your eyes are going to go back, you know, roll back in your head, seeing so many figures. And, Here's our washer connection, and the washer is the size of a washer, point, it's 0.9 inch in diameter. And it's, it's reasonable for the size of the bolt. You know, it's a model, idealization. RBE3, the stresses, like that. And so under tension, what do we know? We say, well, 2,900, well, reality a sloppy bolt, 3,400 perfect world. For a lap joint, we have this bearing stress pin prick, and then we got 6,600. And I like the 6,600. It feels reasonable. And if we go through all these, really the closest it's reasonable is with the RBE3, with the washer. Anything with an edge connection, not even close. I mean, the nice thing is conservative. Stresses are high. I mean, that's a useful piece of information. I mean, just knowing that, okay, if you do an RBE2, you put it on edge, whatever stresses you get are going to be conservative. And if they're below the, your yield stress, they're below your margin, ugh, don't raise your hand, stop, move on. Really, that's the way we operate. I mean, it's oftentimes it's just simple go out of the gate, go out of the gate, hey, it passes. We know it's conservative, move on. But it's nice to see. If you don't have that margin, you put an RBE3, it's not so bad. It's, it really lines up nicely with a washer. And if you use an RBE2, you're still conservative, which is useful. Yes, someone said, wow, it doesn't pick up the buried stress, you know, the compressive. Well, you saw before, if you're, if you're concerned about the bearing stress, you really just got to pull out the shear. And you got to go in and do your bearing stress count based on your material allowables. And it's compressive. And usually, I used to be a material scientist. And compressive stresses, I always call it a site to get, it, get something breaking under compressive, it's 3x. 
because you know you have defects. If you load it up with 3X, then you're going to get the equivalent stress to run a hole under compression. So my real thumb is sort of like compressive stresses is sort of three times yield before I start to get worried. But that's how you would do a bearing stress. And the, if you're really concerned about it. Okay. Hey, Bending. George. Yeah. Uh, so just a bit of clarification when we say edge versus washer, the edge uses an RBE just to grab the nodes around the inner edge of the hole, whereas the washer approach grabs, you know, several concentric rings of nodes. We're not actually putting a washer in there. We're just expanding the amount of nodes that RBE grabs on. Thank you. There's our, there's our nodes being grabbed around. Man, it's nice having you. Nice having you co-piloting co on this. Good. Okay, bending. Same drill. We go edge, and then we go washer. And I'm half hour into it, so I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit. This is edge connection. And since we're doing bending on it, I know someone's going, "Well, bending. Really, we should we should have contact." And we should, you know, because the plates are going to come in and, 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 and sit against each other. And so, okay. And setting up in FEMAP and, and NXNASTRAN, it's really simple. Uh, uh, put in bolt preload. It's like nothing, click, click, click. But it's nonlinear. Still nonlinear. And, yeah, you can do it on these simple models, but, but good luck on a, on a couple million node shell model with, with solids and everything and throw in contact for your bolt preload. Um, you know, you may be, may be waiting, but for these very simple models, okay, let's, let's put in contact since we got bending. We do the same edge, we do the same with the washer. Let's get to the summary table. Oh, 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 I did miss it. Yeah, I do like this. This is very nice. You use RBE3 with contact, you do get some very nice, beautiful stresses. You know, you get away from the stress concentration of the RBE2. And you can, since the stresses are low in 3200, you get more into the, the bending stress region. You get these nice colors. Well, at the end, we have our 3D model. Bolt snug, bolt preload, principal stress, amesis. The winner is the RBE3 with the washer. It really lines up. The best, I mean, when I say lines up, I really, I look for something that's conservative. I mean, even though with contact down here, you say, oh, look at this, exactly 3,300. But it's got, it's nonlinear. It's not conservative. It's, it's, I always want something higher. So I like this. I mean, we can look at the RBE2, even more conservative. With edges, well, everything jumps up, but hey, it's conservative, which is which is a good trend. Everything is coming in. <laughs> all our connections with RB2, RB3, they're all conservative. Just it's really good. If you got the margin, it, it works. Okay. What do we what do we really do? You know, when we get through with the stresses and everything and all set up. Well, we always pull out the axial stress, or axial force, and the shear force of the bolt. We dump it in a spreadsheet. And of course, you can go to new and you have these nice diagrams for between the shear stress and the, and the axial stress of your bolt going through here. But at the end of the day, it's a spreadsheet. And this is an example of that first model that I showed at the very beginning, where we had all these bolt preloads, and you come in and and you dump it into your handy dandy spreadsheet, and you pull in your shear force at the at the different beam ends, and you have your axial force, and then you go to the result, and then you go to your safety factor, and you got all these different calculations and stuff for your beam. It's, it, it works out really sweet. You know? And that's classic. I think everybody does it like this. 
you know, and you got your components, you get nice and organized and color and stuff. So, and then you can go to town, whatever the client wants. It seems <laughs> all the, I would just say the, the bigger manufacturers, they each have their special proprietary boat formula, <laughs> you know, for, for fatigue. Um, this one, I, about what about bolt bending stresses? And this was, I thought, was really good. Uh, this came um, from another consulting group uh, in Endeavor Analysis. And, and uh, they're really, uh, I, I, okay, they're the experts in, in bolt loading and fatigue. And uh, when we have a project that's a little bit sneaky on bolts, uh, I call them. <laughs> I, will, I gotta admit, I, I don't know everything. And so, but check this out. See how you got the little curve here and you got the bolt under bending. Now this is highly exaggerated, right? You know, this is, you know, you got the bending. And so what they suggested, what they do is they include a bit of bending stress into their bolt calcs. And the way they calculate it, sorry for, for going to throw it, but the way they calculate it is that, well, you take the bolt shear stress, right? Because that's the load between the two plates. And then you assume that, okay, even though the bolt is clamping the plates together, you're going to have a little bit of shifting of the bolt. You're going to have a little bit of contact above and below the plane of, of where the two plates are bolted together. So they, you know, they assume some, some gap, for example, you know, a hundredth of an inch. Then they use that shear force and, and on it, and there you have your moment. And then given the diameter of the bolt, you can back out in your spreadsheet, the beam, you know, the bending stress of your bolt. Then you can add that on to the axial stress and you have a, a, a more conservative and I think more accurate way to extract out your bolt stress, what's occurring. I thought it was super clever when I heard that. So again, conservative. Now, I'm sure there's some engineer, simulation engineer in the back, which is going, well, what about vibration? Because we're doing these bolted connections and, and that's, uh, you know, that's one of the big things. And um, just to back up is that I took the 3D model and I ran it, you know, I put the bending load on it and um, preloaded it. You know, did the normal molds analysis with a with a full on preload, everything included. You know, complete, la di da, and I got I got a nice number. Then I thought, well, what the hell? I should just run a transit, right? I should just take the bending load and just whack it. You know, let it vibrate. And I know you guys, it's it's going to be hard to see some of this because it's you know it's going through the line and and stuff. So let's go ahead and. I'll pick a node right there, and we'll look at the vertical displacement. And you get this nice, you know, here's our preload. Here we're applying the bending load, we release it, and we get this nice trend. Now, let's go in and look at just the squiggly part, like that. Now we can go to operations, and we'll go down to FFT. Check this out, 46.8 or 47 Hertz is the fundamental frequency of this. And the reason why I want to, well, you probably know, they're saying, okay, why is it dying out? Because we got friction between the plates. When this is full 3D, there's friction, both preload, and so the friction is dampening it out. I thought that was pretty sweet. So 47 is about as real as we can get. And the winner, RBE2. And I don't think that's a surprise to a lot of practicing engineers out there that have had their models validated against shaker tables and stuff that, that why don't we use RBE3 for all the bolted connections? Because, well, you don't get the stiffness of the, of the bolted connection with the RBE3. I mean, you get better stresses, but uh, you, know, you don't quite get the stiffness. Um, and I did it both ways. I did it as a, with no contact. And I also did it with contact, with bolt preload and contact. 
And that's, again, that's really easy to set up in FEMAP and NXNAS trend. You just go ahead and it's a pre-stiffened normal modes analysis. And it's, it's like click, 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 done. And so these models, if you want them, they're, they're gonna be with the, with the seminar package. So that's why you see the, the one and the two. One is linear and two is, is the nonlinear pre-stiffened. And so I go out to five modes and it's interesting. You, you get some real differences as you get away from the first mode. Um, you know, it it's, uh, makes me a little nervous seeing stuff like this, you know, but it's pre-stiffened. Um, I'll, I'll say this is that now that we've done more and more analysis, we typically, if we if we have a structure with lots of votes, uh, and we know we have to do vibe, and it's it's sort of a mission critical project, we'll we'll go ahead and put contact. We'll pre stiffen it up, and that's sort of been our standard the last oh, two years. It's really only because the software has gotten so much faster, computers have gotten faster. It's like, okay, we got to do vibe. Uh, I'd rather pre stiffen it up. First mode is pretty good. And as you guys know, of course, RBE3, well, force interpolation, no stiffness, it's gonna be softer. So I thought this is a lot of fun. This is very useful to run through. It also is fun doing the full 3D. Always wanted to check that out. And this is just standard preload, and, you know, through this model and crank it up. Okay, last one. Fatigue. I did say we talk about fatigue. Now you guys can say, wow, where's your fancy fatigue program? Don't you have a fatigue program? Yeah, we, we do have a fatigue program called Fatigue Essentials. And yes, you could use it on these bolts. It's, it's set up to take data from FEMAP. And it's also set up to take data from spreadsheets. But uh, for bolt analysis, it, it's, well, I don't use it. I mean, it's for rain rain flow analysis, it's really more for, for solid structure stuff. But in something like this, this is a very classic bolted together plate assembly. I can't show the whole model for various reasons, but it's a honker. And here's our API. This API will be uploaded to with a package. It's, it's all set up. And this is our spreadsheet extractor. And first, they'll ask you for what groups you want. And just to keep it simple, I'm not gonna pick a whole bunch, I'm just gonna pick one. And then, oh, I, I did this through an and Well, maybe you should only pick one beam property and keep it simple. And instead of trying to do all, all type because there's a lot, and, and I could do that too. I could go under here and pick, we'll just pick one bolt like that, but it gives you flexibility. And it's a it's a simple API. Of course, you know we could put a progress bar across the bottom, tick 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 tick, tick like that. And but what it does, it grabs go it goes through, grabs all your bolts, runs, writes them out into a spreadsheet. See, this is blinking now on my screen. It says, "Hey, you're ready." And that's it. Now, this is this is the basic version. And with it, you know, you could add your shear force top and bottom of, of each beam and you could do you could do a lot more with it too. And you could have it also set up through other calcs. But that's it. 38 minutes. Well, Jeremy talked for three or four minutes, so I'm under schedule. Adrian, any questions that I should should answer for the next six no, months? No, I think we got most of those covered during the main presentation there, um, you know, talking about the washers. Um, another thing was for those rigid elements, what sort of degrees of freedom are we using? And I mentioned that for the RBE2s, we're using the three translational degrees of freedom. Oh, for those deep wait, the, RB, the RBE2s, I'm doing all six. Are you doing all six? Okay. Oh, and then, then that raises a question. Who knows? It might be better if I use all three. <sighs> oh God. I think so the idea is question. <laughs> everyone everyone has these baseline models to play with and easy updates to make. Um, I know. Yeah. So and then RBE threes, we stick to our, you know, only use three 
for the independent nodes. We'll use right, the for the RB3s. And uh, I, I got to say, this was a really useful exercise for me. I, I, I learned a few things. I can't, you know, I can't say, oh yeah, you know, it was like mundane work. It was really funny because I've never, I've never sat down and done a comparison of one by one with the techniques. I mean, absolute, you know, like, okay, keep it simple, clean, one by one comparison. And I've never seen anything in the literature that, that you know, goes down and nails it this tight. Not saying this is the best work or, you know, like this, you know, I'm just saying, I haven't seen anything that, that does sort of a side by side comparison out. So it was useful. But um, one other thing is people were, were wondering about using C bush elements versus C beam elements. There you go. That could be, that would be, oh, that would be clever. Because then what you're saying, of course, you'd have a high vertical stiffness, right? Because that's your beam. So you really want to transmit your beam really sweet, right? So you take your C bush and you give it, you know, the 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 stiffness in, in the direction of your beam super high. So it's going into the bolt. But then you would loosen up the in plane stiffness. But then what would you do with I know you know what? It, you're gonna end up in the same way before because look, if you're pulling on it in tension, you gotta transmit the tensile load. So if you make it loose and goosey, you're like an RBE3, a force interpolation element. Does that make sense, Adrian? You know, if you make yeah. if, if you make uh, your C bush loose and goosey, it's an RBE3. So in tension, it doesn't matter. In bending, yes, it could be really clever because bending you could have high vertical, and then you it not, wouldn't be important about the side by side. So you could loosen that up. And the material would be more accommodating on the side by side. But oh baby, now you're talking about tuning your C bushes about whether your structure is going to be at a tensile or bending. So I don't think I think that adds complexity that could get that could burn you down the road. Yeah. You know, that, I, that, I really think of a of a beam element as, you know, a, a six degree of freedom spring. You're just calculating your stiffness values from your cross section rather than, you know, punching them in by hand. So mm -hmm. you really get yeah. identical results depending on which stiffness oh, values I you there. Oh, you mean replace a beam element with a C bush? Yeah. Oh, that sounds scary. Oh, I don't <laughs> I, I mean, oh it's modeling. They, people say, wow, that's really complex. And you know, they look at FEMAP, like new people say, wow, that's really complex. Can't they make it easier? And they go, well, what do you, I mean, simulation is, there's so many different ways to idealize the structure. What do you, what do you want? You want power or do you want easy to use? And that's, oh boy. So I, I always find it amazing how many years I've been doing this and I'm still learning stuff. It's a continual process of, interesting cool stuff i, I still got to say i love the adding the bending stress to your boat calc i really think that's that's really clever i'm just sort of i'm just jealous that i didn't think about that you know what about boat bending stress because now they say well you know you got a beam element you can use bending you know it gives you bending stress right well where does it count it's just like completely useless because if you have an RBE2, RB3, it's, it's calculating that, that stress based on the, you know, where the, where it's connected. And yes, well, then you could move your, your beam element down to the midplane. Ah, oh, just forget it. I think it's just, you know, you just put it up to the top or wherever. And I really think this is, this is just take the shear force through it, one element, do a little distance, add that in for your bending stress. Um, on it in the spreadsheet. So, Adrian, did one minute. I'd like to keep these. Yeah, I guess the only thing else I would mention um, there were some yeah. questions about, you know, how does preload and external load affect the forces in the bolt itself rather than the stresses in the plates? And I would direct people, we do have another bolt preload seminar from years back, which is a little bit more focused on the bolt forces rather than. Oh, you're right. Forces. So, yeah, you get to. Dig into yeah. the formulas that have, 
you know, a ratio of stiffness to your bolt versus stiffness to your structure, how external loads affect bolt loads. So there's there's more resources on the applied website with the rest of the uh, the well, webinars. Best. I want to say just Google. Oh, it's crazy out there of the number of masters thesis. I think I found three of them just on bolt modeling. You know, the same thing. Build a 3D bolt, compare it with other things, and um, bolt load. And of course, you know, the bolt preload and the, all the various calcs of, of you know, of course, I, in a perfect world, you're going to, your bolt load will always be high enough to absorb any alternating load. That's a classic on fatigue. There's your, you know, of course, you're going to have a high bolt preload, bolt will never cycle. The, the, your joint will never loosen up. It always stays shear locked. And um, ideally, if you have a lot of alternating load on a, on a joint, it's pretty much toast as soon as it loosens up because all the load's going to go in the bolt. The bolt will get torn up. So it's sort of like anything that's going to be cycled in that sense, you're always doing a high preload, you're doing your cow, you're, you're making sure it always, any sort of alternating load stress stays under that preload and you're you're putting Loctite or something to ensure it never loses up. Um, it's a, uh, that's a whole nother discussion. So yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to close out. Documented, so go check it out. What? I said it's, it's a documented, so. Yeah, it's documented. Oh, Google. But, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close up here. I think I, I really like this slide. It's something we developed this year. Like, who who are we? And uh, we're a group of engineers. And we have these, we have a complete process from design, CAD. Uh, my business partner, I should mention, he's right in the center. I'm right next to him. There's my, and then my, my business partner, Pat Barrett. He's got a machine shop. He's got a 3D printer, a carbon 3D printer. He's, he's the, I'm the, we are the simulation group predictive. And then he's like everything that you need. If you need to build something, he's got the CAD, the CAM, the team setter and everything. So it's really a nice setup that we have because simulation engineers are not design engineers. So that's a good thing. Okay. Adrian, Jeremy, I know you're yeah. on mute too. No, Wrap that was great. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, George. Um, you're welcome. And yeah, again, if you guys need anything, just reach out to us, George or myself. Reach yeah. out to Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have engineering projects. No, it's uh, as you guys are clients, you know that Adrian and I and Brian Cole we manage the technical support side for LS9 and FEMAP and and Star CCM Plus and NXEA. Uh, anything to do on on software, buying, training, questions, licensing, please talk to Jeremy. He's a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> Adrian and I are the technical guys. We want to answer stuff about boats and, and modeling and shells and plates. Okay, we're done. I'm going to shut it down. Thanks for attending, everybody. Yeah, yeah thanks. happy holidays.